Hello there everybody and welcome back to episode 2 of my tutorial series for Against the Storm. Today we will go into the topics of expansion and exploration. I'm going to talk about how we're going to keep our city fit and how we're going to get ourselves towards victory. Now, one of the very first things that we're currently seeing is that our food stockpiles go down, indicated by that red asterisk here or arrow and let's talk about food everybody does go for a break and eat something after two minutes except for the lizards and the harpies they do that every one minute and 40 seconds if somebody doesn't get something to eat they'll start starving they won't die immediately off because of that you can check out here the hunger tolerance this is the amount of times that they can tolerate not to eat something. Once that is uh, that threshold is broken, they'll die off bit by bit. They'll also get uh, more and more angry about being hungry. This uh, imposes a uh, penalty to your uh, moral being found here. So that means since every season takes roughly four minutes, every citizen needs two pieces of food per season means roughly six per pieces of food per year. So in our situation here, we have nine people, we have 75 pieces of food. Considering our equation, roughly we got more than enough for another year, but we need to do something about that. The easiest part is to go here and start collecting things via your collector camps. This is raw food. This is basically the lowest tier of food, but it's the best that we can do currently. So we're going to assign the people here. Well, actually I'm going to assign only one of them and let's move things slowly forward. I'm also going to unassign some of these chopping jobs as I am going to breach open now into a very first clade. So I'm holding down left shift again to make a very narrow designator over to this uh, direction. We could technically also open up this one already, but since this is a tutorial aimed for beginners, we're going to start with a small one here. Because, you know, there's no real reason to, to go all frisky about it already. So, here we have found a patch of fertile soil. That's this stuff here, and when you mouse over like that, you also get a summary about the things that you found. So, we found here flax fields that provide us plant fiber. That's ideal for the fabric production. We found a small abandoned cache. That is a uh, event that can spawn somewhere, everywhere out here. And this one we can now either break open or we can send it back to the Citadel. We need a different item for either resolve and we get a different reward for either one of these uh, resolutions. So we either break it open and uh, pilfer coal and wine or we send it back to the citadel and get some reputation and amber back. Amber is currency in this game, like gold. Now, cash always can be used to be sent back to the citadel and the reward here is only scaling with the size. The content, the contents of one of these caches are always super random. You don't know what's in the box before you open it. So this fertile soil here on itself is not useful. We need a farm or a plantation to get it going. So these though are not available from the get go. We need to draft these. So we have a first goal for our drafts. Therefore, we now know that we can utilize that material quite decently. Also, we can place down a harvester's camp in the vicinity of all these. As you see there, there's a lot of flax to be uh, gathered there. And with that knowledge, we can now clearly vote for the weaver because we have a pretty Net nice income for the time being with plant fibers. We can harvest them directly. Also wanted to mention that plant fibers are also found in every uh, tree to some degree. So therefore, like I said in the previous episode, getting the basic building materials covered in your first few picks is always a good idea. So here we can now choose between these three buildings. Here I see one synergy right directly, that's coats. Coats are something that your people will just pick up and consume. You see, 
there is here a need for clothing. So this will make people happier if they have access to it. The lizards, they don't care about that. They just, uh, they just uh, roll with it. Speaking about lizards, we just gained another uh, villager because of the cornerstone that we picked at the beginning of the game. And we have one homeless person. So quickly, I press left shift over that house and we can place it down. And some wise commenter finally gave me a uh, info about that. Houses are not anything that your people will path towards to, so you don't need to connect them with the road network at all. Okay, now then, this means we have a direct uh, connection here. We can make fabric, and out of that fabric we can make coats, because we see here we have direct conversion into coats. You see also that there are stars behind these recipes. That is a efficiency class. The Clothia is really efficient at processing fabric into coats. If the building would have less stars, it would take more fabric to get the same output. So in a nutshell, the higher the star rating, the more you get out of your resource. That is exactly the opposite way in the case if we look at our crude workstation, which has even only a hollow star, not even a filled one. This means this building is even worse than a building that has one star. It's uh, really the the lowest tier. It's just there so we can build these materials before we have drafted anything or if we get super unlucky with our drafts. That's what it's good for. Now then, I think we are good to go to also open up the uh, second glade here. So I marked these trees for cutting and we're going to open that dangerous glade as well. We should be capable of resolving that problem on the glade on our own and if not, well, we will find a way to uh, to get the items that we require. Most important things, when you want to open a glade, have some workforce available. Two workers are the minimum. You need to get yourself some, some workforce ready in some degree. Okay, let's move back to that point. I will pick up the clothier because I feel like this is a good pick. And now we have the last one. Here we have the carpenter capable of producing planks, tools, and luxury goods. We haven't drafted a single building so far that would yield us any farming or food. So that's a bit of a uh, unlucky thing to happen. But in all honesty, having the carpenter and the clothier to get, uh, and the weaver together, we have already a really important part of our production down. And as you see here, these buildings that we have drafted, they all require more modern products or advanced building materials. So we're going to put one of our workers inside here and I'm uh, unchecking for now all of them because the first things that I want to do is I want to limit these productions that only 10 of these are being made. This is a highly inefficient workstation. I want to minimize its waste as, as much as possible. Next thing on the list, we select what kind of materials we want to have processed. Here it's standard to have plant fiber, but if your map provides reed and leather too, you can do it like that. And here we have the same thing. Clay is the standard designated, but we can also make bricks out of stone. Okay, now that's all configured. We can reactivate them or never deactivate them. I just have grown that habit to deactivate everything up front so I don't accidentally produce something that I don't want to. So since our building that we need the most, the carpenter or the weaver need planks for, first and foremostly. We're going to make it like that and I'll just do a preference order like that for the time being just to showcase a little bit what we can do with this. All right so opening up that glade will yield us now a new quest and new things that we can work with as well. So our woodcutters can be repositioned just like that. And you hear the cracking of thunder. This is a clear sign that the storm season will be upon us soon. So in the current scenario, I am not that afraid of the storm season because people are relatively happy. We ha are at hostility level zero, so there's nothing too bad in, up, uh, up front of us. I'll be explaining that a little bit more in a hot minute. So this is the first dangerous clade. As you see there, there's much more going on here. We have 
two events waiting for us. One is a large encampment, which allows us to just uh, either pick up new people or send them back to the citadel with some food and get some nice amber reward for a bad. And this is our first troublemaking event. So we have here escaped, we, we, we discovered escaped convicts. So this event will now produce a negative result if we don't deal with it during the next 13 minutes. Then these things will happen. We'll gain one impatience point and they'll destroy caches that are hanging around on the map because, you know, convicts got plunder. Keep in mind that once this clock goes down, the event isn't resolved because of that. You still have to deal with it. Then we got here, again, different ways of resolving it. Here we have an empathy solution and a loyalty solution. Empathy is, well, how the name implies, most of the time the nice guy solution, and loyalty is the solution that is good for the uh, home city, for the queen, so to speak. So we can now either persuade to keep them, which will give us a minus six to global resolve while we are working on that event, or we arrest them with the while using either training gear stone or tools we have none of those so we most likely will be best off by persuading these we'll also gain these rewards for that we will also gain a lot of new people into the village so that's pretty good so far so let's hold down the b and uh, the letter b and you'll see there you get a highlighter of all the goods on the on the on the clearing First of all, we have gained a lot of uh, building space, and we have gained new nests where we can pick up food from, and we gained a deposit of sea marrow. Sea marrow is a mineable fuel. It's uh, burnable bone, burnable rain punk bone, I don't know. It's just something that is very valuable in many, many ways. So we're going to open up the glade like that, and here we have found our first large patches. Large patches have a lot of uh, charges and they need a specialized building. Unlike the small patches that can be harvested by each and every camp, we here cannot work with a small camp anymore. We would need a large camp. The harvester's camp is the only one that you always have in the big version. I don't know why that is. Must be some idea of the devs, maybe to ensure that we always have enough fabric. I don't know. Either way, we cannot use these moss broccoli patches, sadly, because these would be a really, really good source of food, as if things go really lucky, you can even pilfer three units of food for one charge of deposit. That's really, really good, but sadly, we are not getting there. And another wise commenter has pointed out that I was wrong in the last episode towards the crude workstation and the makeshift post. These can be moved for free. I don't know, maybe it was in a previous version differently. I was fond of my memory that this wasn't possible. Thanks for correcting me there. So, we are going to build a path up here as we totally want to go into this direction. Now then, let's get the time ticking again. And we have here now two workers available for whatever. Tell you what, we're going to put one of these were for the time being both of them to the stone cutters camp and as you see here the stone here can also deliver various things if we check out all of these deposits there is not a single thing in the game that i know of that only drops off one resource so this is a a, a trademark of this game so to speak so get used to it now you see that this hammer icon tells us we got no builders. So holding down left alt gives you this wonderful overview here. So when I check with my wood stockpiles, I notice that I have really a lot of that. So I right click these dudes now to get them out of the workshop. And just like that, we got this. So you can also hold down left control to show you another nice hotkey to see what recipes a workshop can provide. So we now know that these items can be made there. Really useful if you want to get yourself an overview about what your city can produce or not. Okay, so storm is upon us. Let's check out what it does. It does for now to us this. We have a 
penalty to or moral. That's because we are suffering from Looming Darkness. Looming Darkness is the baseline debuff, always present, and you get another minus four for each and every level of hostility on top of that. This is how the game tries to kill you. One of the many ways, but this is the most prevalent and most dominating factor. The more hostility, the more the forest tries to kill you. Your job is to keep the hostility, therefore, as low as possible. We're playing on a low difficulty level, therefore, we're not getting that much hostility debuff. But, well, here goes another nice thing that you can do. We're going to go now and resolve that event here with the workers that we got. And check out that the uh, time goes down, the more people you put in there. And we are going to stomach that minus six to global resolve. I know that this will get us uh, below the point where we can safely survive. I do this on purpose to showcase a little bit of things here. So first of all, the lizard's resolve is now on a target of minus three. The lizards have a very special trait which allows them to, you know, their, their moral drops way slower. Watch the, bi uh, the beavers on the uh, other hand. Their uh, moral goes down much, much faster. The humans are somewhere in between. This is a stat called... I don't know anymore. <laughs> it's uh, resilience here. So that is a really useful effect. This can go so far that if your lizards are starting out on a positive level of, let's say, plus 10 to plus 15, they might be even never reaching the minus level before the storm is even over. Really good stuff. Another thing is worth mentioning, as soon as this thing hits zero, another timer will go off around the face of the, uh, of the uh, species, and when that red timer goes off, the first person will leave town because of unhappiness. And as we see here, people are all over the board a little bit unhappy, so we can re-up another worker and give that shelter a higher priority to make sure that the homelessness is not so much making people ha unhappy anymore. In a bigger picture, it would be smarter to just wait for the storm to pass and then do the uh, event afterwards. I just wanted to show you here how this works. And on the same page, you also have that button here to favor a single species. As you see here, if we press that button, the lizard's happiness goes up by five points and the other people's happiness goes down by five points. So plus five, minus 10. It's always a bad bargain, numbers wise. But if the other people are happy enough, you can easily bounce away the problem. And if the red marker goes running already, you can bounce it back upwards again to stop them from running away. Just mind you, the progress on that red runaway marker gets saved for the entire storm season. So if somebody is almost at the brink of running away and you bounce him back upwards, it's all fine. If you let him drop on minus that point again, he just starts at the same point where you left him off. So you have to keep the people happy, but you could bounce then the unhappiness back to somebody else. If that sounds too complicated or anything to you, don't you worry. In the upcoming episodes, I'll be demonstrating these methods way more because this is something that we totally will need to survive the higher difficulty levels. I'm talking about this red marker. This progress here is memorized for the remainder of the storm. Storm season goes over and happiness goes back up again as the looming darkness debuff passes away. We still have one and a half minutes of that uh, escaped convict event to stomach, but all in all, it's uh, not killing us. And another good thing is to mention, we'll get a lot of new people in the, into the village or city because of that, which will be a lot more things that we can get done. We also have our first quest completed. So we can here pick up the reward and we get a new role. As you see, whenever we, let's do this too for a demonstration's sake, whenever we reach one of these blue blobs here, we get a new blueprint for the draft. So we found our first farm building. In this scenario, it's a pretty difficult choice. 
We have the cookhouse, that is a food producing building. And as you see here, we can produce skewers and biscuits. And here we have a our first complex food. And you see there's on slot one, four different uh, ingredients that we can put in. And on slot two, four different ingredients that we can put in. Eggs, we could fulfill. That one, not quite yet. Maybe we can procure that. Either way, you put eight pieces in, you get 10 pieces out. And it does make pe some people happy. Complex food is always a gain. Biscuits, you put eight pieces of flour in and three of these, and you get 10 pieces of biscuit out. Here it is 11 versus 10, but mind you, flour is not edible in its raw form anyways, and it's produced out of things that often cannot be eaten raw either. Grain cannot be eaten raw, so. This is showing us another thing though, none of these complex foods in here is producible by us right from the get-go. That lowers the attractivity of this building by a lot. So the herb garden on the other way, on the other hand, provides roots. This is a raw food that we can eat directly and herbs that are ingredient for many, many things. So we picked the herb garden and we can go here into the recipes panel, show all and yeah, sadly it only shows what we can produce with it Der. ah here that's what i've been looking for and if you want to know what you can do with these there's uh, a lot of things that you can see this way you'll see the entirety of things that you can do out of herbs so they are used for one for these red packs these are used for trading you need them to do trading basically and you can also put herbs into biscuits as we already saw into pie into porridge there's a lot of food things that we can use it for and if you don't know what to do with a certain good fret not in this game you can always sell it off to the trade caravan if you don't need it now, new year means newcomers and a new cornerstone. Let's begin with the cornerstone and let's see what happens here. So global production speed is faster, but traders will arrive slower. Really good if you don't need to rely on trade too much. And every villager with their need for education fulfilled will be faster. This is one of these situations where you either pick a cornerstone that tremendously alters your gameplay by halving the amount of trading that you can do versus one that possibly will never do something for you but it also will never hurt you so in that scenario i always put it down like that pick the one that changes your gameplay if you feel like the change of gameplay feels like it's good for you apart from that if the other option is something that you might want to try out you might pick it and if you don't want that there's always the option to decline but declining is really always the least attractive option of them all it's much better to just try to grow into the shoes that the game offers to you because cornerstones are victory conditions sometimes it can totally make all the difference for your gameplay. We're going to use this here because a 33% uh, increase of global production is amazing. And since this is a low difficulty mission, we don't need to rely on trade that much anyways. So we're now sitting in front of the next thing, the newcomers. So you always get to select two different groups with two different uh, sets of items that they offer. I'm going to pick up more of the beaver people or will I? No, we're going to pick up more of the humans here. Every species has special skills. The beavers are ex uh, excel at woodcutting and the humans excel at farming. We found two fat pieces of fertile soil, so I just figured that we'd be way better off with investing harder into our farming game now. So I'm pressing M here to move these dudes, as I like to use hotkeys as much as possible. Freeze up your fingers for other things. And let's move that makeshift post down the road here. And I'm going to add in another road this way. As I want to connect towards the farm. I don't build roads for the um, collector's camps. 
as I personally feel like they're uh, just a temporary thing most of the time. You won't keep them forever, so it's not worth a road, but uh, that's only half true. It's always worth a road if you have workforce to spare, as these dirt paths, they don't cost you anything. So, Anyways, first thing that I always do when I have new people arriving is building them homes. We already know that this event here will spawn five new people, so we might work ahead of time here a bit. And mind you that you always want to build inside that yellow circle here, as this is your area of effect for the hearth. People cannot live in a house that is not in the vicinity of the hearth. Not possible. Not happening. Now, let's put down farm fields on top of that. And double clicking these, or well, no, I don't need to double click this. Here again, I want to have these built as fast as possible. Holding down left shift and putting the priority on two makes it so that all of the farm fields inherit that new priority. I want to get this done fast because of the fact that farming can only be done in the uh, in the drizzle season. And maybe we can even crank out a tiny little bit of uh, farming progress in this season still. So we put down the herb garden like this. And you see that white border should be including all of the, um, of the uh, farm fields that you're building. Mind you, a, fertile, a piece of fertile soil without farm field is without any value. So, the delivery of these planks is in progress. Somebody will pick them up in, in, and uh, transport them to the main warehouse immediately. Here he goes. That's the point where we can see a farmer. So, ideally, you want the farmers on the fields in the beginning of the drizzle season. That's when they plant. In the clearance season, they harvest. And in the storm season, they put fertilizer on the fields. That's the basic circle of events. You might have heard that uh, bright noise a moment ago. That's the noise when one of your uh, things here gets completed. All right. Let's check back with that. And the farm is done. So you can check out these icons here. Farming proficiency. That's what the humans have. Every species has a industry where it's good at and the industry that it enjoys doing means either double yield in this regard humans have a chance to double the yield while harvesting very powerful or a plus five resolve bonus for the industry they enjoy that's the other option that you can go for now with all the people that we got here we can finally man all these collectors uh, things we can also build a new collector's camp right next to the eggs and we really need to up our game now concerning food production we've just taken in so many new people we're going to have to feed these somehow as we here clearly see we had a uh, stockpile for a year a moment ago but that was when we only had nine people now we are sitting at 19 people and these people here take that time six so we end up at uh, a whopping amount of uh, almost 120 pieces of food that we're going to need over the time of one year alone so this is to illustrate how darn pressing the matter is to get yourself food production going. Luckily, we got a couple of tricks that we can utilize already. Here we also have a very, very tragic uh, case of moss broccoli in the way of our pathways. So you can destroy these. You can press V or click that thing and you can destroy a patch. I wouldn't ever recommend doing it, but uh, if it becomes very, very clear and apparent that your city ain't gonna use these resources like ever. Yeah, it's an option. You learned it here. But um, do this as sparingly as possible. That's all I want to say. So we're going to put down another herb garden here. That one won't be um, staffed out with uh, people 
before the next year because we're not gonna make it before the um, next clearance season to get this done. So our city is already in sort of a uh, problematic situation and that is because our food stockpiles have run really concerningly low. We have a income source, two of them actually. The drizzle wing nest provides egg and meat. And the uh, berry bushes provide also berry, but mind you, these are finite resources. The farms here, they'll take a while until they get into full gear. But here we have a similar problem. The farm is producing roots at a lower rate as it is producing herbs. Herbs are, again, not edible raw, but we're going to take care of these problems in the next episode. So let's check out the orders and then we're going to do the outro. So three more glades versus coal and building material delivery. So I'm going for that one as it is easier to fulfill. And here, deliver jerky to your population versus deliver wine and pottery. We're going to take well, since I don't know if I can produce jerky or not, I'm going to postpone that decision. Here, there's again nothing to lose from that. I can just wait if I'll see during my uh, drafts if I can get myself a jerky source. That's that for today's episode. Thanks for watching. I hope you find these helpful. We're going to continue on the next episode on our way to victory. And thanks for all your kind comments. The next part of the series will be a higher difficulty level, of course, but we're going to take it step by step, like I want it to be. Leave a thumbs up if you considered this helpful or you liked it to show the algorithm that it can recommend it to other people as well. Leave a subscription on the channel if you enjoy what I'm doing in general, as this is helping you to keep up the notifications. And of course, check out the description box, leading you to various links my Discord, my Twitch channel where I stream each Sunday evening in the Middle European time zone, and of course PayPal, Patreon, and buy me a coffee. Big, big thanks to all the supporters out there. I deeply, deeply appreciate what you're doing, and a big, big thanks to you watching this video series up until after the ad roll. Deeply, deeply appreciated. Hope you have a good time. See you all on the next one. Bye-bye.